All right, your adrenal glands. Okay, your adrenal glands sit on top of your kidneys. Okay, so on each side, so we do have two of these. And we have two regions. We have a cortex, which is the outer region. Okay, and then we have a medulla, which is the inner region. And we produce all kinds of hormones in your adrenal gland. We have catecholamines and steroid hormones. So you can see in our image here, each different region of your adrenal gland is responsible for creating a different category of hormones. So we have quite a few examples to get through. So here we go. Your cortex. Okay, so remember your cortex is your outer layer. We divide the outer cortex into three sublayers. They have weird names. Zona glomerulosa, zona fasciculata, and zona reticularis. Okay. Your and that is that would be superficial to deep. Okay, I should point that out. So we're going down into your adrenal glands. Your zona zona glomerulosa produces mineral corticoids, and our best example is aldosterone. Your middle layer, your fasciculata, produces glucocorticoids, and your reticularis produces uh, androgenic steroid hormones. So one at a time. Here we go. Aldosterone. It's our mineral corticoid of choice. It's our glomerulosa layer, that first layer that you would come to. Again, if we're going superficial to deep. Aldosterone targets your kidneys. Okay. Aldosterone is one of the biggest players with regards to regulating your blood pressure. Okay. So aldosterone is absolutely 100% something that you cannot forget about. It comes up over and over and over and over. Okay. So what does aldosterone do? It helps you regulate blood ion concentrations. Okay. Things like sodium, potassium, hydrogen ions. Increasing uh, aldosterone secretions why would we do that? Well, if your blood pressure is too low, okay, if your blood volume is too low, or if your blood sodium levels are too low, or if your blood potassium levels are too high, we would secrete additional aldosterone. Okay. Now, what happens when we do that? Okay, how are we going to regulate that? We don't need to just continually reduce, or excuse me, secrete additional aldosterone. That would be bad. Okay. So there are some things that we can use to regulate aldosterone. The first is a big decrease in sodium levels would cause a small increase in aldosterone release. Okay. So it's not necessarily a large change ends up with a large change. Okay, so a large change in sodium levels really only causes a small change in aldosterone levels. Okay. Increased potassium levels okay, would stimulate aldosterone production more so than a big change in sodium levels. Okay. And vice versa here. So a decreased sodium, or excuse me, decreased potassium level would inhibit aldosterone secretion. And then high stress levels, um, your hypothalamus would directly trigger the increased secretion of aldosterone. Okay. So we have a couple things that would trigger or inhibit the release of aldosterone. So what happens if we secrete aldosterone? We start this, and it looks overwhelming, but we're going to break it down. Okay. So our biggest trigger for releasing aldosterone ultimately is a low blood pressure. Okay. And that low blood pressure could be caused by low blood volumes or some other root cause. So if your blood pressure is too low, okay, that triggers your kidneys to release renin. Okay, renin is a hormone all by itself. That renin will travel to your liver. Your liver will then start cranking out angiotensin. Okay, angiotensin is a vasoconstrictor. Okay. So just the process of vasoconstriction will increase your blood pressure by itself. But we really want to make sure that we get that blood pressure back up. So we're not going to stop there. That angiotensin okay, is going to be converted. And you can see that here in our image. So angiotensin from our liver, okay, or angiotensinogen, excuse me, gets converted into angiotensin 1. And then we're going to turn it into angiotensin 2. 
And then, ooh, look, y'all. Look at all these things that happen. Mm. We got all kinds of subsequent physiological changes. Angiotensin II is responsible for several things. Okay. Angiotensin okay, causes your adrenal cortex to release aldosterone, okay, which was our original focus. Okay. That aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption. Okay. So we are going to start keeping around more sodium ions than we had previously been keeping around. When you increase the absorption, or the, excuse me, the reabsorption of sodium, water is going to passively follow. Okay. So aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption and indirectly causes water reabsorption. Okay. When you passively increase your water reabsorption, when you hold on to more water, your blood volume goes up. There's literally more blood in your vessels. When your blood volume goes up, your blood pressure goes up. Okay? So the whole pathway, it's called the RAS system. Renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Okay? So take a look at this image. Okay? Make sure you understand. Okay? Here's aldosterone way over here. Okay? So make sure you understand how we got there. Okay. Also, please put yourself an extra little note over here about the actual function of aldosterone. Okay, aldosterone causes sodium reabsorption, water follows. This increases your blood volume, which increases your blood pressure. Okay, I cannot tell you how many times that's going to come up. You've got to know this pathway. Okay. So we've moved on to our middle layer of our adrenal cortex, our fasciculata layer. This is where we produce glucocorticoids like cortisol and hydrocortisone. Okay. These hormones target your body cells and your tissues and have a couple of main responsibilities. The first one is gluconeogenesis. Okay. Gluconeogenesis, if we break down that word, Okay. Gluco would be glucose, sugar. Neo is new. Genesis is means to make, basically, or to form. So we are forming new glucose molecules. How are we forming those new molecules of glucose? We are breaking down fats into pro and proteins into glucose. Okay, for energy. So your body really loves glucose. Okay, but you also know that that's not the only thing that we eat. We also eat fats and proteins. Okay. So the cortisol, the hydrocortisone, all of these glucocorticoids help us utilize our other sources of energy by turning them into glucose, which is a little bit more, I don't want to say useful, but a little easier to use. Okay. Glucocorticoids also break down proteins, um, not only to be turned into glucose for energy, but we can remake them into enzymes okay, that would be used during metabolism. And we have some resistance to stress and anti-inflammatory properties here, okay? Now, there is a bad side effect of this part. Um, if we are reducing the anti-inflammatory anti properties, then we are technically lowering our immune response, which means that we are more susceptible to actually get sick, okay? So too much cortisol is a bad thing okay it leads it makes us more prone to getting sick and if we're doing this gluconeogenesis too much okay then this will raise our blood sugar um, usually if we're really really stressed out um, we're then not burning off that energy like we normally would and so that new um, glucose just gets stored as fat okay so too much in the means we get sick and we get chunky all right, our inner layer of our adrenal cortex, our reticularis layer, is where uh, gonadocorticoids are produced. These are sex hormones, steroid sex hormones, that target the gonads and other reproductive tissues. Um, these are produced here in very small quantities, and most of these are weak androgens, um, also known as the, some of the male sex hormones. 
Um, these will then get converted to testosterone and estrogen um, in males and females respectively. Okay. Now, again, we're going to have some problems. Addison's disease occurs when you hyposecrete either aldosterone and oricorosol. You can see our patient before and after treatment. Um, symptoms include weight loss, muscle weakness, fatigue, low blood pressure, skin darkening, um, and then salt cravings or um, what's known as pica, which is basically you crave um, things that aren't food. So a lot of people that suffer from pica will eat dirt and clay, um, which we all know is not normal. Um, and then Cushing syndrome. Now you're going to hyper secrete cortisol specifically. If you suffer from Cushing syndrome, um, you will suffer from obesity, moon face, bump, uh, stretch marks, buffalo hump uh, on the back of your neck. You will be irritable. You will have anxiety and depression. Um, Hirsutism, uh, which is basically male patterned hair growth, um, and then skin bronzing. So you can see our before and after patient. This is before she suffered from Cushing syndrome, and this is after. You can see that she's put on some weight. This is her buffalo hump, um, things like that. All right, so we've made it into our adrenal medulla, the innermost region. Okay, This is part of your autonomic nervous system. Okay, So this has a neuroendocrine function here. The chromaffin cells within your adrenal medulla are responsible for releasing epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, which could be termed adrenaline and noradrenaline, whatever um, terms you prefer. These hormones are responsible for your fight or flight mechanism and your rest and digest mechanisms. So don't forget that if we're doing our fight or flight, just for example, okay. We would increase our heart rate, um, decrease our bladder effects, dilating our pupils, slowing down our digestion, all of those things that allow us to fight or flight. Okay, so your adrenal medulla is actually part of your autonomic nervous system. Okay, your sympathetic division specifically. We're going to do our fight or flight here. All right, your heart, your beautiful, warm, beating heart releases the hormones called atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP. Okay. This is the peptide hormone, which keep in mind um, does the second messenger system. So we use CAMP to activate protein kinases. This is secreted by the heart in response to high blood pressure. Okay. So uh, ANP will lower your water reabsorption. It will lower your sodium reabsorption. Um, and it also reduces fat in the circulatory system, which is kind of nice. But the water and the sodium, if we decrease reabsorption of those, that will actually lower your blood volume, which will lower your blood pressure. Okay. So the aldosterone that we mentioned a couple slides ago, we said that was used to increase your blood pressure. ANP is used to decrease your blood pressure, so these two are antagonists. All right, your pancreas. This is both an endocrine and an accessory digestive organ. Okay, so let's see, organs. Uh, your beta cells of your pancreas are going to produce insulin while your alpha cells produce glucagon instead. Insulin, the target cells here are your liver, your cardiac, your skeletal muscle cells, even your big old brain. Okay. Insulin is used to promote the uptake and the storage of nutrients. We do this to lower blood glucose levels. So right after you have a nice big meal, insulin is released. It triggers your body cells to take up all that glucose from the blood and actually use it for energy. Um, and it also promotes satiety, okay? Uh, your body's feeling uh, of being full after you eat. Now, the glucagon, uh, targets many similar organs, your liver, your muscles, but now we also stimulate adipose cells, your fat cells. The function here is quite a bit different. We would now stimulate glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis to raise blood sugar levels. Okay, so if you have to skip lunch for whatever reason, 
okay? You still need energy to get you by until you can have a snack or you can have dinner. So glucagon gets released, it goes and targets your liver and your fat cells um, and your muscle reserves. We are going to take any of the glycogen that we can find, specifically from your liver. Um, we're gonna break that glycogen down Okay, so lysis means to break. We're going to take those glycogens, we're going to break them down, we're going to turn them back into glucose. We're then going to use that glucose for energy. We can also take um, some of the fat and do gluconeogenesis, which we've previously mentioned. We'd be building new glucose molecules. Both of these processes are meant to raise your blood sugar levels back up to normal. Sometimes things go wrong, y'all. Um, you could suffer from diabetes. There are several different types of diabetes, but specifically when we talk about blood sugar levels, we are referring to either type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Type 1 sometimes is referred to as juvenile diabetes. This is actually an autoimmune disorder where your pancreas just stops producing insulin. Um, so you would need to do regular insulin injections to make use of the glucose in your body. Now type 2 diabetes, also referred to as diabetes mellitus, this is acquired over time. Um, your pancreas becomes less efficient at either making insulin or the insulin itself becomes less effective. So all of that blood sugar that's just floating around, it's not being used properly. We tend to start storing it. Um, treatments for type 2 include diet, exercise, and it could even include medications and insulin, but um, either one of these and you are going to need help regulating your blood sugar levels. Your body can no longer do it by itself. Your little pineal gland um, up in your brain, kind of opposite to your hypothalamus and your pituitary, he's back here on the other side, um, secretes melatonin. Melatonin targets your reticular formation in your nervous system, in your brain stem specifically. This is involved in your sleep-wake cycle. So here's your pineal gland, your reticular activating system runs along this section of your brain stem. So melatonin helps us not only regulate your sleep-wake cycle, but it also helps regulate your sex drive and your mating behaviors. Um, it will probably not come as a shock to you that secretion of melatonin increases in the dark, um, which coincidentally is the time that we tend to like to go to sleep. Okay, so that's not exactly a coincidence there. And our thymus gland, your thymus, which sits basically on top of your heart and lungs, right under your thyroid gland, so this weird looking thing, that's your thymus. Again, this is almost never in any of the anatomical models that you might see because we're always uh, more concerned with looking at the, the heart or the lungs, so we usually just take that off. So your thymus um, secretes thymosin and thymopoietin. Okay? These hormones target T lymphocytes, which is one of the main categories of immune system cells that you have. T lymphocytes specifically um, will migrate to your thymus. And then the thymosin, the thymopoietin, trigger the T lymphocytes to mature. Once they become mature, then they become fully functional T cells, and then that's when they play a bigger role in your immune system. Okay. When you are little, when you are younger, um, your thymosin, uh, your thymosin, your thymus is a good bit bigger. So as you age, your thymus kind of shrinks a little bit, becomes more fibrous. Um, it secretes less thymosin, thymopoietin, because you already have quite a, a good amount of mature T lymphocytes. It doesn't completely go away. Um, you still need to have some capability of maturing T lymphocytes. But when you're little, we're still trying to build up that immune system. So it's just bigger and more functional when you're little. All right, that concludes our discussion on the endocrine system, thymus, um, thyroid through thymus.